thank you. Um, and thanks to Stanford for the opportunity to come and present during this um, population health session. Um, I'm going to go a little bit off script because I got really inspired by the previous speakers. Um, but we'll still, we'll still go through the deck, but uh, I'm just going to do it in a little more um, informal fashion. So um, my background is I'm a board-certified pathologist with subspecialty boards in molecular genetic pathology and an additional fellowship in pathology, oncology, informatics. And that's just because back in the day we didn't have the term precision health or precision medicine. But essentially I've been a part of this field for my entire professional career. Um, I was a resident when the Human Genome Project was finished. And you know all this talk about, um, for all of these years, about how are we gonna start to reap the benefits uh, of that program, and what are the next steps, and when can Precision Health actually start getting to the population? Um, and, and inspired by the, the previous speakers, particularly um, you know, all of me and Verily, um, and people who are actually starting to, to implement these large-scale studies. Uh, one of the things that is, is just really exciting to me about working with color is um, that they've actually built a platform that can help institutions more easily bring uh, precision health technologies uh, to their uh, populations. And I know people, if you, if you know of color, you probably think of us as the um, genetic testing company that kind of dropped the bottom out of the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer market. When we came to market um, in 2015, uh, our price for a 19-gene hereditary breast and ovarian cancer panel was $249 um, and included genetic counseling uh, along with the testing, um, where at that time it was pretty typical for it to be you know, $4,000 just to get two genes. Um, but that was just the start. That was a way uh, to begin, and it was um, an application around which we could start to build a platform. Um, and working with a lot of uh, key opinion leaders and uh, uh, researchers and clinicians to better understand the processes and where the touch points need to be with the health system, but yet kind of redesign this, take this one problem and kind of redesign it so it made it affordable and accessible um, to more people uh, who, who needed it, and then build up the support tools that go around it, make sure that you know, there's physician education support, make sure that there's, like I said, genetic counseling, make sure that there's a way to um, reach at-risk family members and, and even reach across the health, to, into different health systems, into different states, into different countries to find them um, and make them aware of their risk. Um, so the, the platform that Color has built out we, yes, we do sell into doctors' offices and doctors' clinics, but we also apply um, the same platform selling into self, large self-insured employers. So we're with over 70 um, self-insured employers who give color to their employees as a health benefit. Um, and we also collaborate with uh, large research um, partnerships, like 100, we, the Wisdom Study is an example with the UC system. It's a 100,000-woman study. Um, and so in building out um, of the platform to support these different channels. We now have recruitment and engagement tools um, that we've developed for the research and um, uh, enterprise, enterprise channel, as well as um, tools that can help you analyze and support data in a dashboard you know, that can draw up your data. And so that um, allowed us to actually open up another channel, which we announced about two weeks ago, where we did our first partnerships um, with health systems. And so the, the deck that I'm presenting today is going to kind of focus on why, why would you know why our health systems interested in, in doing this and how color can help um, help them implement this in almost a turnkey fashion. So um, you guys are probably aware of Geisinger and the su success that they've had and kind of the model that they've set out of um, implementing uh, precision medicine and, and um, genomic medicine as well as um, this kind of evolution into a learning health system where you, you deploy um, a new health technology and then you track outcomes and optimize to make sure that you're getting the most benefit um, out of those new technologies. Um, and so other health systems are, are, you know, there's a growing interest for more health systems to emulate Geisinger. Um, and the, there's, some of the motivations are listed there um, on the, the screen, and the motivations change from institution to institution as to which one they value more. But I think everybody's really becoming aware of all of these, um, that patients really value 
uh, a health system that gives them this preventative information. You can watch the patient testimonials um, from Geisinger or Nova or some of those other systems that um, uh, were kind of the, on the cutting edge there. Um, and uh, so the patient appreciation is there. And then there's also a marketing factor of being able to say that you're providing precision medicine uh, to your population. Health plans could benefit if it, it, um, depending on the health economics. And then these last three points are um, really around implementation science and um, having the systems and the recommendations and the guidances that are now starting to come out about how you track outcomes um, when you're implementing a precision medicine application. Um, and people have mentioned this ability to do this in silico research, or I've been calling it labless research, but it, you know, this big data, big genotype, phenotype databases, for example. Um, you know, faculty members need to stay relevant and they need to be able to have access to those kinds of data sets and those kinds of tools um, in order to stay relevant. And, and um, you know, Geisinger can recruit top talent to, you know, rural Pennsylvania, um, but, you know, before the opportunity to kind of work with these data sets. Um, and then there's also the opportunity to leverage this as a data asset. Um, so how can we help health systems get started? Well, we start off, we just got to pick an application, something that's relatively non-controversial, really well studied in unselected populations, um, and really kind of um, ready to go as a, a population screen. And so the CDC tier one conditions are these three. Um, it's BRCA1 and 2, Lynch syndrome, and familial hypercholesterolemia. Our current system does a terrible job of identifying these people who are at risk. Most, 90% of people who have a mutation in one of these genes are unaware of their risk. Um, and they're completely treatable and there's well-established preventative guidelines. So um, some other considerations that, um, oh, before I go on that, I wanted to point to that reference. The National Academy of Medicine has um, a genomics and population health action collaborative. Um, which I'm a part of, and, and for about 18 months, we've really been working on um, some white papers um, that will be available on this website, but you can kind of see the work that's been done to date, and that these are the three conditions that will be recommended in this white paper for health systems and public health agencies interested in implementing a population genomic screen. Um, these are some of the other reasons uh, that the, um, round the Action Collaborative was focused on these conditions. Like I said, it has been, these have been studied in large unselected populations, so we do understand what the true penetrance and prevalence is, which allows us to then actually do a health economic study to determine if this is a reasonable thing to implement into a, a large population. Um, there have been some published studies looking at um, health economics of uh, universal BRCA screening, and that actually shows that at colors price point, it is, it is um, cost-effective, and it is as cost-effective or more cost-effective than pap smears or mammography. But nobody had um, yet commissioned a, uh, a study that looked at all three of these conditions in a universal setting, and so Color commissioned that from a company called Precision Health Economics. Uh, these are the results. The, the takeaway is that um, it's, it's cost-neutral for you to implement this, but that a hospital system who chooses to implement universal screening will um, uh, avoid 1,700 cancers and um, heart conditions and detect an additional 1,100 at an early stage rather than a, at an advanced stage. Um, and like I said, the cost will be the same at the end of the time horizon. Either way, you're spending the same amount of money, but hospital system that implemented the universal screening gets all of those benefits that we listed in the first slide, including the, the prevention of, of, of all of these ca uh, cancers and uh, heart conditions. The budget impact, it boils down to, it would cost a health system 20 cents per person per month to implement this. Um, so this is where I get out of sync because I started off um, talking about what color has built, but um, it isn't just a test. Um, it is a, a platform that um, supports uh, implementing genetic testing into large populations. It includes um, a collaborative family health history. It includes um, physician education, genetic counseling, um, really all of the things that people, when they're concerned about how, how are we going to implement something like this into a, a large system, we've tried to build that into the platform. Um, I mentioned our partners already um, and how that has kind of focused um, the development of this platform and how we've been rolling it out with them for the last three years. And that just recently we announced our first um, partnerships with health systems. 
And so the two applications that we've seen um, be requested so far are either the CDC um, tier one conditions into their entire population or um, a 30 gene um, extended hereditary cancer panel into their um, cancer center, so all cancer patients. Um, and this is just, again, I wanted to just compare and contrast uh, all of the reasons that we've been talking about for almost 20 years of, you know, how are we going to start, you know, putting precision medicine in, into the population and getting it benefit out to as many people as possible. Um, and then if you contrast it and look at the components of Color's um, platform, you can see that, you know, we really have addressed almost all of the barriers. And so we're really excited to... Um, you know, continue working with the, the self-insured employers and the research programs where we can do regulatory compliant research return of results, um, and now really excited to start getting this into um, health systems. Um, and if you want to, so what I've been talking about is the light blue. The dark blue is if you also wanted to add on a whole genome or a whole exome for all participants, it doesn't really cost that much more to do it if you're already doing the, the light blue stuff. And um, the price for the population screening is $199. And you can find all the references and resources at those links. Great. Thanks. <laughs>